Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Optimizing Mother podcast. I'm very excited to be here today with Chaim Ashkaraskin. Hi, Chaim Ashka. Welcome. Thank you, Sarah. So glad to be here. Or known as Chaya. Chaya is a proud shlacha in Ellenville, New York, and she and her husband have a beautiful home of eight children as well as a vibrant Chabad house. Now, Chaya, some of you might know, started a blog about seven years ago because she found herself struggling. She was in her fourth pregnancy in four years, and she started writing about it. She started researching about it and tried to understand for herself and share that process with the world, the importance of large families and how it's practical. I'm sure you got many comments about it. Now, what started off as a blog, thegiftofchildren.com, Chaya shared her experiences, insights from the Tyra, from the Rebbe, empowering mothers about family size to answer the inner or outer voices or critics. And with every single post, Chaya was very real about her struggles, sharing the insight, the paradigm shift that helped her. And then what we are lucky enough to have today is all those blog posts are compiled in a book. And the book is called The Gifts of Children. We are waiting excitedly for it to come. You could pre-order it now, right? Kaya, how could they pre-order it? Mosaicapress.com. Just put The Gift of Children into Mosaic Press. And we really want to touch on some of those topics from her book to really inspire ourselves as we're getting closer to Pesach, as we continue on each of us on our parenting and mothering journey. So I want to dive right in, Kaya. You okay with that? Absolutely. Let's get right into it. Okay, so when we think about families, and this could be small families, big families, having a bunch of little kids, all ages, it can very, very easily get overwhelming. You know, the thought of jumping, of pulling, of tugging, there's a million to do. And I think before we get into like the hashkafic ideals of, of having children, you know, there's the practical piece that comes up when people think about it. Like, what's your like go-to approach to dealing with the overwhelm, you know? Baruch Hashem, you have eight kids. <laughs> That's eight outfits before Yom Tif. That's eight people to feed and bathe and brush teeth and do homework. Like, how do you tackle the overwhelm of there are so much, so many balls to juggle at any given moment? Um, okay, so there's definitely a lot of overwhelm. Kind of acknowledge that. I think the most important thing is really to work on your mindset before anything. I think that today with social media and in general the way the world works, just knowing everything about everybody else's life and everybody sharing all their amazing things on social media, we start, we expect from ourselves a very, very high standard. Start comparing ourselves to everyone else's best. So like you said, you know, with all the yumptive outfits and all the different meal planning and it just goes on and on how much you can expect from yourself um, I think the first thing we need to do is to recognize that we don't need to be everything. We don't need to be as good as everyone. We just need to provide for our family in the best, the best way that we can. Of course, it's very helpful to have systems, and systems are extremely, I mean, talking about yumped of clothes. So I buy for my boys. I, for Hashem, I have six boys and two girls. So I buy the same shirts for all my boys all at once from the same store every season. <laughs> I buy the same pants. And I'll be honest, the girls gets overwhelming sometimes. The babies can get overwhelming because I need to figure, I need to go shopping. I need to look for items. Um, yeah, but knowing that you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to try and uh, be as good as the Joneses is really, really, really key. Watching, watching in your head even... I would say things like the state of your house can really get to you, the way your children look, if they look messy, they're crying, if they're screaming. Um, these things get much more overwhelming because of the way that we translate them. A lot of times when we see kids screaming, it's not just my kid needs help. It's like this house is out of control. Um, nobody's happy here. I'm failing. This is awful. I can't handle this. And that is the mindset that makes us feel extremely overwhelmed and anxious and upset and it just becomes a big spiral because then we react to it you know not in the way that we want to and then the children get more difficult and then it really becomes extremely overwhelming so the real key is to recognize that it's very normal for a house with a lot of children to be very busy to be messy to be loud to be dynamic and all the things that are going on in your house are completely normal um, the fighting, the screaming, you know, even if you are reacting in an imperfect way, that's also completely normal. And if you can accept that, 
it really allows you to deal with it in a much more healthy manner than if you're constantly criticizing and getting upset at yourself because not only are your kids awful, but you're even more awful than they are in the way that you're reacting to them. It's really about having your mindset, recognizing that you're human, you're meant to be human, your children are meant to be human, um, and however you are is just wonderful. Um, so just do the best that you can and you'll be successful. Now, it's true. It's true that we have this like unattainable, like perfect model, especially when you look at the magazine and family table and you're like, does anyone like really do all that and have like a full tablescape every Shabbos? But I'm thinking also not just like, you know, the the perfectionism that doesn't exist. What about just like the, the scattered brainness? The like, I have a million things to do at this very moment. Like, I'm with my kids, but my mind is, is, is running and racing a million times per hour of everything that has to get done. How do you, I guess, stay present with the kids in the moment? All right, so I would say there's two things to that. First of all, I think sometimes we take on a lot more than we need to. Um, I would say specifically when it comes to something like making Shabbos, making supper, even the state of our house, we hold extremely high standards. We want everything to be homemade. We want everything to be super healthy. And that means that you need to spend a lot of time cooking in the kitchen. And that means that you need to spend a lot of time cleaning. And that means, I mean, maybe even you just have too many clothes and that's why you have so much laundry. Maybe you don't need so many clothes and you won't have quite as much laundry to go through. I think you need to think about what you're actually doing and how much of it is actually necessary. Um, because really your goal in order to raise your family in a healthy way is to be able to be present for your children. And that means not to be busy with a thousand other things. And I know a lot of that we really can't help. Um, a lot of the times we have work. Um, I mean, most of us work. Or in my case, we have shlachos. We have so many different things that we're busy with. And running a household is a, is a very difficult challenge. At the same time, when our children are home, and for most of us, it's only a few hours a day, you know, right in the morning and then in the evening before we put them to bed, um, they really need us to listen to them, to hear them, to be with them. Um, and there, from there comes our, my second point, which is you really want to take it minute by minute. Um, today's world really doesn't teach us very much how to be present and what being present means. Um, we're constantly on our phones, even when we're walking through the street, when we could be looking around us, enjoying the sky, enjoying the trees, enjoying our environment. But we're so busy being productive on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, distracting ourselves. Again, because very often we're not happy with our situation and we're busy criticizing ourselves and we're criticizing our house and we're criticizing our children. And we're just, we're so critical of the way we're doing things that we're just escaping so that and that's totally normal and it's natural and that's our world today and it's not again not another thing to be critical about oh I'm scrolling on my phone when I should be looking at my children it's just life however if you do want to make a shift um, and this is something that I consciously did and consciously do to this very day in order to work on being more present with your children you want to start literally one minute at a time. And when you have this opportunity, you know, when your kid comes over to you and says, mommy, mommy, right, that's your chance to try it. You put down your phone, you walk away from that pot, or you could even be standing at the pot and still mixing, but look at your child, look into their eyes, look at their face, look at their features like you've never seen them before. You know, it's just, it's an amazing, amazing thing, which I... I recognized it once when I was at my mother's house and my nieces and nephews were with us. And I like to sometimes, I mean, like an aunt, I picked up my, I don't know if it was a little niece probably. And she was maybe a few months younger than one of my kids. And I remember noticing, you know, like, oh, she's so light, you know. And then I realized, wait, I don't even know how my baby feels because it's just second nature to me and I don't really feel him. So I was like, well, let me try this. Next time I'm holding him, I'm going to try to actually feel his weight and feel what he feels like, just like I felt my niece, who was a new baby for me to hold. Um, and I, I, and I, I realized that this practice is extremely, extremely helpful to really use your senses, your eyes, your ears, listen to your children's voices. Uh, also, I noticed this with my nieces and nephews much more. I could hear this one has a really funny voice. This one has a deep voice. This one has this really cute voice with these kvetches in it. And when I started listening to my own kids, it just makes them that much more endearing to you. When you listen to their voice, when you look at their features, their little eyes, their little nose, the cute little mouth, the way they speak with a little lisp or whatever it is, 
So take that like one minute when they come to you to tell you something and look at them and take them in fully. And, and, and that's enough. That will really, really feed you and that will feed your child um, and that will guide you. You'll know after doing that, you'll know what you need to do to connect to your child so much more than if you're just distracted and you just say, yeah, what do you want? Or, or you know, what's going on? Or how can I help you? Um, when you actually look at them and connect with them, um, it has a much, much stronger impact. So you can do it like that. You can also, you know, consciously choose to sit on the couch when your kids are playing in the room and just do nothing. Just literally sit on the couch. And what that ends up being is an invitation for your children to join you and to just sit in their mother's love, which is something unusual, I feel like, for us today. We feel like we always have to do something. You don't have to read them a book. You don't have to play a game with them. You could just sit with them and... They will right. talk. Otherwise, they it's know another what to do. productivity thing. You're reading a book. Check. No, you do not need to game. be productive Check. all the time. Exactly. You know, it is our Pesach now where we're recording our Pesach and hopefully we'll release this soon. I'm curious, like in the frenzy of preparing for Pesach, when there's so much of you between cleaning and chopping and turning over, right? This year, this is the, the, the toy. There, there's so much to do. Like, how, how is that like practical to just sit on the couch? You, you feel guilty existing without getting something done. So once again, I will say literally if you do it for two minutes a day or five minutes twice a day, if you're feeling generous, that's a lot. It's a lot and it's enough and it's, it's fantastic and it will really, really help you. Um, and eventually you might end up getting used to doing it more and you might choose to do it more. But even if you don't, a few minutes a day is a major, major um, move and it will have a major effect on your relationship with your children and on your mindset. Yeah, we, we don't have time to sit all day. We don't. But a few minutes we can afford. You know, I love it that you're, you're saying it in such small increments because it's actually very reassuring because there's probably the guilt both ways. Guilt if I do nothing. Guilt if I don't do, you know, if I'm doing too much. So, like, knowing that a few minutes of being present is valuable um, it is, really, is, it is really validating. But it's also interesting because these things don't happen on their own. Like, in order for us to make these decisions to change, we can't be running an autopilot like we have to be consciously working on ourselves thinking about it you know what i mean like getting off the the run 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 the rat race the rat race to, to be present so i'd love to hear a little bit from you again you know with so many responsibilities what does it look like for you to take time to work on yourself to think about it to to think about your your chenok, your mothering etc and and how does that benefit your children um so I guess the perspective that I would say is important when it comes to being machana for your children um, is a lot of us come without meaning to with very, very high expectations for our children um, that are really not only not realistic for them, they're not even realistic for us. Like we expect them not to get angry and scream. We expect them to put everything away we expect them to be kind and generous and not to get mad when people take things from them. We don't have such standards for ourselves. We're not perfect. I mean, I haven't met a mother that doesn't lose her temper once in a while, um, that is constantly calm and loving and giving. So it's really important to recognize what it means to be human and that our children are human and that we are human and it's all perfectly fine. Um, and the way that we can work on our children's um, on these kinds of character traits is really by working on them ourselves. Um, I think that as much as I'm still imperfect and I'll still get angry sometimes, as much as I work on myself not to react in the way that I don't want to react, my entire house is much calmer. My children will also suddenly um, be able to control themselves better because I'm able to control myself better. So I find that the more you're doing your own inner work, the more your children will absorb that. And in a way, it's kind of a shortcut for you because I feel like um, when you're already in your 20s or 30s or you know beyond that, it's much harder to change. But if you are able to do that at your age, as an example for your children who are at a younger age and it's a lot easier for them to change themselves because they're only being formed, you're really giving them much more than you're even giving yourself because they will have the advantage of having learned that character trait at a much younger age. So really working on yourself um, is the biggest gift you can give to your children and the biggest way to be mechanach them 
first of all, by your example. And second of all, that once you have acquired whatever the skill is that you need, it will be a lot easier for you to give that over to your child when they are in a moment of anger or when they need to learn how to consider someone else or have empathy. If you have those skills yourself, it'll be easier for you to teach them to your child. And first of all, they'll see that you do it also and they'll recognize that children see everything. How do you balance, though, between the, the perspective of not expecting yourself to be perfect, but still allowing room for growth? Like you're saying basically two opposite things that probably go hand in hand. I'm just curious if you could like, like don't expect yourself to be perfect, but... Yeah, you're not perfect. You're going to fail. You're not going to do everything right. So in a way, you need to, you need to really... You need to accept who you are. You need to accept who Hashem made you and who Hashem made your children. And at the same time, you want to give it your best shot and work step by step on making yourself better. Um, but as humans, even in that process of making ourselves better, we're going to fail many times and we'll never, ever, ever be perfect. And being perfect is not a goal. It's just not, not a goal. Nothing Hashem wants from us, nothing that's possible. And thinking that we'll be perfect is extremely detrimental. So we're not looking to be perfect. We're just looking to be as good as we can and increasingly a tiny bit better. Like I said, being present minute by minute, um, controlling your anger. If it's not going to be all day, that's fine. That's fine. The one time that you did it, that you held your breath, that you bit your lip instead of saying what you wanted to say, that's what you need to do just once and be proud of yourself. And having a positive mindset is really, really, really important um, in order to continue doing this work. Because as long as you're criticizing yourself, you're just sending yourself into a negative spiral and it, you lose your strength for doing what you need to do. All right. Now, Chaya, I know that in your book and through all your blog posts that I got to see on Facebook as they were coming out, you know, you speak, you write so beautifully about how important it is to have more Yiddish children and how passionate the Rebbe was about it. But I'd love a little bit more practical advice. Like it's physically could be draining, you know, what more physical, practical advice do you have? Okay, there's one really, really big thing I would say. The most important person in your home when you are raising your children is you. And that's not just on the level of expectations of how you behave, um, but it's on a very purely physical sense. You need to sleep. You need to eat healthy. You need to move. You need to have friends. Okay, and I know, and to some people, this sounds super overwhelming because as mothers, we tend to push ourselves aside and we think that, well, I have to take care of my family. I don't have time for this. No, you are part of your family. You're the most important part of your family. You're the bedrock of your family. So in whatever way you can, and I'm not going to talk about self-care because I don't even like that word because it makes people think you need to go out and get a manicure. No. You can, if it works for you, if you can figure out how to do that, and that's something that makes you feel really good, definitely try to do that. But I'm talking about taking that 20-minute nap when you need it. I'm talking about prioritizing going to bed um, on time, you know, with enough time for you to sleep and actually feel rested. I'm talking about taking the time to prepare yourself lunch so you'll actually have food. Um, I, I can't say this enough that the only way I ever manage in my house is because I sit, like seriously prioritize my needs. Um, I am not a sleep deprived mother as much as I have had eight children in 10 years. Majority of nights I get six, seven, eight hours of sleep. Um, and that's the only way I could manage. I couldn't function without it. And my husband knows this and he backs me up and he supports me because he knows that my health and my needs are an extremely high priority, not because I need it, but because the family needs it. Um, and the same thing is for food. Even if you don't have time to cook yourself those foods. If you need to buy it, you know, specifically in the time, you know, right after birth or when you're pregnant and you just need that extra nutrition, order it in, you know, figure out what you need to do that you can get the nutrition that you need. Because I believe this about children also, when they're not behaving, it's very often simply they need sleep, they need to eat, they're hungry, they're thirsty. Um, and the same thing is with us. We can't behave, we can't be our best, we can't demand anything from ourselves when we're physically not up to it. Um, so it's we really so need to funny, make it a priority. Kaya, I did not expect you to answer like this. 
I was expecting like tips. I don't know what you were going to say, how to organize it. Like similar like what you said before about like buying the same shirts. Did not expect you to go in this direction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But no, I, I'm actually like- extremely passionate about it. And I forgot to mention it. You know, sometimes when we're having conversations, you like automatically go to the tips. No, this is this is the first thing. First, first thing. Take care of yourself. Of course, yeah, being organized is great and lowering your expectations is important. But if you're not a person, you can't do anything. And it's all a shame shemayim, like you said. It's not for you. 100%. It's, it's for Hashem. Like Hashem, Hashem. For needs- Hashem and for your children. And I say, this is something I, I use in my book a lot. Um, and I find, I, I can't remember where I've seen it, but that the tool of imagination is really, really important in Avedis Hashem. I think maybe you would know where that comes from. <laughs> is it in Tanya somewhere? Or am I making that up? I'm not sure specifically what you're referring to. Okay, so why is imagination important? Um, when I had a hard time, you know, when I was working on all of this, and I, you know, I still have hard times. So what I'm saying, when I had a hard time coming to terms with this idea that I need to take care of myself so much, and sometimes even when your children don't like it, right? They may not like the idea that mommy's taking a nap for 20 minutes and she's not available for them, even though they're perfectly safe and okay. Um, but I need to see it as. I would imagine that I am um, a nanny who's hired to take care of the prince and princess, right? So you're taking care of a royal family. Is it responsible for you to show up to work without eating lunch? Is it responsible for you to show up at work on three hours of sleep so that you're snapping at the kids every minute? That's very irresponsible. Um, And obviously when it's not in our control, that's not what I'm talking about. But as much as it is in our control, We have to remember our children are Hashem's children. They're royal. They deserve to have the best nanny. And the best nanny needs to be a a, a healthy human being. So she needs to take care of herself before she shows up to work. Okay, so let's talk more about your book and and more about the inspiration. So you're saying, you know, in terms of the overwhelm, we want to not have unrealistic expectations from ourselves. We're not going to, you know, not perfect, taking out, making it work, being practical. But I'd love to hear more about the, the inspiration to inspire other mothers, you know, in the future to have as many as they can. And in the present, when it gets hard or challenging or things like that, what are things that we could remind ourselves about the, you know, the, the joy in what we're doing? Because, you know, no matter what, being a mother sacrifices something. You know, I'm not going to have as much time for outside things. I'm, I will be limited. You know, I remember the first time, like, when I had brought my baby home and it was like, I couldn't leave without a babysitter. It's like you suddenly realize, like, you're not your own person until they're going to be 20 years old. So so you go through these moments where you're like, you need inspiration. What are some of, from all your research and blogs and from the book, what are some of your top inspiring things that you learn? Right. No, it's definitely a lot. It's a lot. So the book really takes this, tackles us in a few different directions. Um, And a lot of what we spoke about until now is also very much included in the book. A lot of it is about practical tips and um, perspective. But, of course, the foundation of all of it is the source, is knowing that what you're doing is a mitzvah. Um, So to go through a few of the ideas um, that are in the first section of the book, which talks about the source of the mitzvah, we know that Puravu is the first mitzvah in the Torah. Puravu means be fruitful and multiply. So clearly that means don't not that we should have one child, but we should try to have as many as possible. And then it continues and it says, and fill up the land and conquer it. Um, so the Hasidic explanation of this is that Haaretz is not just um, the world physically, but it also is what the world represents. The world represents Gashmias, the world represents the perspective of the world, the way the world looks at children today, which is, you know, something of a burden, something that you really have to calculate and be prepared and have everything, you know, all your ducks in a row before you consider having another child. Um, And the Rebbe tells us that really what that Pasuk is telling us is that we need to conquer our natural instinct to buy into all of that and focus on what Hashem wants from us, and that is to build the Jewish nation. Um, so that's one point. The Rebbe actually has about more than 30 sikhahs that talk about this mitzvah. Um, oh, wow. Very inspiring. Yeah, well, I, I actually did not know that at all. Um, but when I did the research, a lot of really, really fascinating things. Um, really what the Rebbe does is the Rebbe just wants us to feel the value and importance of it. And it's not about 
right or wrong. It's about connecting. It's about recognizing that every single child is an entire world um, and thinking about the future of that child. And this is something that my, I do in the book is that I really make that into a meditation. Think about what a child is. A child is not just a kid that you have to take care of. A child is a human being that's going to grow up into being an adult um, and everything that comes along with that. And if we really meditate on that when our child is screaming and needs us to hold them for another 10 minutes again for the third time this hour, like it really helps you calm, calm yourself and choose to be present when you say, well, this child is a precious world um, and right now he needs his mother to soothe him. There's another sikha that talks about how Anechi Hashem Kecha was said to each individual yid, not Alekechem, Alekecha. So Hashem was speaking to every single person, every single child um, that he might send you, to you yourself. And each single one is extremely, extremely important and valuable. And Hashem would have given the entire terror just for that one child. Another point is that when Hashem created the entire world, he created millions, billions of trees, of animals, of all the different things that are filling the world. There are millions and trillions and tons and tons of everything. And the only thing that was created as one was Adam Rishon. And even though he was later split into two, it wasn't a second thought. It was That was Hashem's plan. The first idea was that there should be only one. So that every single person should recognize that it's worth, it was worth it for Hashem to create the world just for that one person. So for each and every one of your children, Hashem would have created the world just for them. And if that's good enough for Hashem, it should be good enough for us to invest our time and our energy and all the, the difficulty that we need to go through. It's worth it for this one child. This child is that valuable. Um, and then there's one more point. I mean, there might be a few more that I mentioned in the book, but one more I'll bring up now um, is that we are taught that Ein ben David ba ad sheikh lukal neshamas shaba guf. Mashiach will not come until all the neshamas that are in the chamber of guf will come down into this world. So it's actually really important in for the Jewish nation that we should have children to bring Mashiach closer because that is ultimately what is in Hashem's intention and what's needed in order for us to be redeemed and to for Mashiach to come. You know, you're talking about, we're talking about being present and how society says do, 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 but, you know, but I don't know if it's only society. I feel like as Lubavitchers, we're brought up with this, they're about always encouraging us to do more, to do more. Like, you know, you did 100, do 200. So I know you spoke about, let's say, pockets of time of being present, but like, how does that go with the Rebbe's urge to do more and more and more? So I, in what you said about the Rebbe said, if you have 100, do 200. If we did 100, do 200. Um, I would just translate that. If you've done five minutes today being present, do six minutes tomorrow, do 10 minutes tomorrow, you know, just keep increasing, keep working on yourself more and more. But I actually do have a source where the Rebbe talks about being present. Um, something we say in davening, Vavram zakin babayamim. What does it mean, babayamim? That Avram lived in each moment. And clearly, if we are home with our children um, and we're raising our children, we should be raising them with our entire self, with our entire being. And that means being present. I mean, if you think about it, do you think the Rebbe's mother or any other Rebbitson for that matter, raise their child while doing 55 other things and not giving the attention to the child when the child needs it? So obviously, that's not every minute, and I'm sure they were involved in a lot, but when your child needs you, and there's the story of Chana, right? Chana and Shmuel. It's also, she didn't go to Shilai. She didn't go to get Nevuah that your average person didn't get. She was, you know, on the highest level. But she said, no, my baby needs me. My baby needs me. There is nothing else that exists in the world. Um, And that's really what I try to tell myself. Um, I actually, ironically, I mean, I don't know if it's ironically, but... My, my first babies were actually very easy babies. Um, as we went on in time, they actually became more difficult. My fourth was my first difficult one, and that's what kind of put me into this whole thing. Um, but my eighth baby now, I mean, he's, he's pretty demanding. Like, he needs what he needs when he needs it, and he's not necessarily going to go down right when I put him down to bed like some of my other kids did. 
Um, so I'm still working on that. And a lot of times, I, it's actually a lot easier for me than it used to be for me to go into his room, shut the door, and I know the kids are outside, and I know it's a little chaotic, and I really actually don't like what's going on that I can hear outside the room, but my baby needs me, and that is the only thing that matters right now. Um, and that's, to me, being present. And because I'm, I have that mindset, I'm able to look at his face and look at his chin and look at his little nose and kiss his little toes and just really connect to him, even though... My first instinct was frustration because he's not doing what I want him to do and he's not letting me do what I want to do. Um, but instead, when I'm present and I really connect to him as a child of Hashem, as the most precious person that exists on the planet and giving him my heart, um, and then it fills me and I feel much better after I actually end up settling him. And then, you know, it was a little out of control for five minutes. It's not the end of the world. I can go out of his room and deal with the kids now and they'll be under control in a minute or two and everything is just fine. Beautiful, beautiful. There is an important point that we can't forget. As valuable and important as it is to have children, it's not everybody's job all the time. Um, first of all, by the fact that Hashem doesn't offer that as an option all the time. Um, but even when, you know, physically it might seem to be an option, um, we're not having children because this is something we have to do. That doesn't work. It doesn't work to, to rate. You cannot raise a child because someone else said you have to. You really have to be up to it, first of all, which is something that you need to discuss with your Rav and Mashpia if there's anything going on. And that could be in a million different ways. Please, please um, don't discount any difficulty that you're having. Any difficulty that you're having is something you need to speak to a Rav Mashbi about. And if it's not an actual problem, you know, or you've discussed it with your Rav Mashbi, it still may take some work to get into the right mindset. And definitely that's part of what my book is there for. And speak to friends, speak to your mother, learn the sikhas, whatever it takes, um, because getting into the right mindset and also adjusting your lifestyle um, I don't know if this is something we addressed yet. A lot of times, at least I found um, after I had my first couple of kids, our default is obviously to continue living the way we were and then just fitting our children into it. Um, so I continued my work. I continued my habits, my schedule, whatever it was, my expectations of my household. And it was like, okay, we're going to adjust a little bit at a high chair, at a crib, whatever it was. Um, but after a while, that stops working. Um, and that's usually the point where we get extremely frustrated, um, where we feel overwhelmed, um, where things start getting really difficult, because we're expecting our children to fit into our current life. And our current life was really designed for a single person, not for somebody that's raising a family. There's a certain point where you really need to completely switch gears and say, actually, the first thing I am as a mother, um, I need to be there for my children, and then what else can I fit alongside there, or how can I do everything else I need to do together with that? And to me, that was a major, major mind shift um, that really helps, because as long as you don't have that mind that mindset, it feels like your children are constantly getting in the way of what you need to do. If your kid is not going to sleep at 7 o'clock when you put them to bed and they're being difficult, right? They're being difficult. They're holding you back from, let's say, you know, I was a freelance graphic designer and I needed to do my work in the evening and my child was getting in the way of that. And that can be very, very frustrating. Um, and I had to come to a point where I accepted that even if it is my working hours, you know, when my child is napping or in the evening when they're supposed to be sleeping and the child is not cooperating, it's not that I have to do my work and my child is getting in my way. It's that my child needs me and so I can't do the work now. I'm sorry, work. <laughs> Rather than, I'm sorry, child, I can't be there for you because I need to do my work. At the end of the day, and I was getting paid by the hour, at the end of the day, Hashem decides how much you're going to make and how much time you're going to have for your work. Um, and really, that's another whole topic that we haven't really touched on, but that's a major topic of my book, is really how to um, have the bitachin and trust that Hashem is going to take care of you. Um, it's funny. That and that's really, really... Question. It was at the tip of my tongue. I was going to ask if you touched that in your book because I didn't see your book yet. I didn't remember the Facebook page. So yeah, let's hear. Let's hear. What Do, do you touch the financial, you know, inflation and everything going on and, and you know, like... Absolutely. Financial considerations. Okay, so I'm curious. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Money is the million dollar question when it comes to having children. Um, as much as we might be idealistic and excited and even, you know, with the program and on board and ready to devote ourselves to our children. Um, first of all, if the children get in the way of our financial ambitions, our career, whatever we were trying to do, that can seem challenging. And also that children actually cost a ton of money between their tuition, between the food that they eat, between having a big enough house um, and everything else that adds up and raising a family. Um, so money. I'll start with what the Rebbe says about it. This is also very, very, very key. The Rebbe says very clearly, when Hashem gives us a child, and <laughs> this is not coming from the Rebbe, the Rebbe quotes it from somewhere, and I apologize that I don't know where the Rebbe is quoting it from, so I'm saying it as from the Rebbe. Um, but the Rebbe tells us that when we have a child, the sustenance the money that is needed in order to raise him is born together with him, the source of the sustenance. Um, so that means that we might not necessarily see the numbers in our bank account before our child is born and understand how we're going to be able to afford it. But we need to trust that Hashem will give it, that Hashem is planning it. Um, and Hashem can provide for that additional child if he choose to, chooses to give it to us. Um, now, how do we relate to that practically? We need to take it seriously. We need to take it very seriously. Um, the first thing is that, I think this is taught in a mimer of the Tzemach Tzedek. The first thing that we need to know is how much do we need? Okay, we need to make a budget for our family, not based on how much we can afford necessarily, but how much we actually need, whether that's more or less than how much we can afford. Um, what our needs are, how much food costs, how much clothing costs, and Clothing means new clothing for Yom Tov. Clothing means new clothing for a school year. It's all the normal standards of where we live and how we live. Really make get that number together. Figure out how much we need. Okay, so we need to have a kli for the parnasa, and the kli is actually the Torah and mitzvahs, is actually working on making sure that we, you know, our husband has shiurim and taira. And I believe having the children is definitely a kli. That's a tremendous mitzvah, and investing yourself in your children is a tremendous chus. Um, giving tzedakah is definitely a kli also. And then we need to come up with a channel. So in our life, what that looks like... Kli isn't the channel? I thought you would take actually a kli. Actually not. like a kli to, to make the money. No? No, it's actually... I think in Chavis Alavavai, it even explains it. Um, and it's it's a misconception that a lot of people have that the, the vessels that we need... No, the vessels are, are spiritual vessels that we need to make. And that's what's most important. And then we just need to make a channel that Hashem could send the money through such and such a way. Um, but the Kli is our performance of Tara and Mitzvah and our connection to Hashem. Wow. So for us, making the channels, what did that look like? Uh, my husband was actually in Kailo for more than the regular standard one year. He was in Kailo, I don't know, four or five years. Um, and as long as that was working, that was working, I had a job. And at a certain point, I actually asked for a raise. I got a good raise. And that was the Kli I needed, at the, you know, the channel I needed at that time. Um, it came to a point that we needed to, we were looking into buying a house instead of continuing to rent. Uh, my husband left Kailo and he looked for a job. Um, at first he took on a teaching job and that panned out for a year or so. And then we saw that wasn't, wasn't going to work for him. What ended up happening is we ended up buying the house, I think around then. And he just ended up connecting with a lot of people that were trying to sell and buy, and he realized that for him to become a real estate agent could be very bef beneficial. So that's what he did. And we recognized that being in real estate was really an unlimited channel because you can make much larger amounts and it's not dependent on the number of hours that you work. Now, obviously, that's not necessarily going to be everybody's story, um, and you can only do your best. But you, you, you need to sometimes look at where you are and look at the jobs and the industry that you're in and say, is it even physically possible for this industry to give me the finances that I need? And if it's not, to look elsewhere. And as uncomfortable as that may be sometimes because people don't like change and we get comfortable where we are, sometimes we need to do that. And that is, that is the hishtadlos that's needed in order to make a better channel so that we can earn what we need for our family. And once we've done chenuch, what we need... Well, what about something like chenuch, where you're not just leaving to make more money, or shlachas even? Um, so, yeah, we ended up moving on shlachas. And it's amazing how that worked out. I mean, we have... There is a setup in our shlachas where there's a tremendous building that can be used as a source of income. 
and exactly how much we're going to make, completely up to Hashem, and we don't stress about that because it's not up to us. We have the, we have the channel. Um, there is a potential. And exactly how, how much Hashem wants to send us through that, that's on Him. Hashem absolutely sends us and can send us money through many, many other channels. Um, <laughs> it sounds funny even, but honestly, tax credits, the more kids you have, they, they give a lot of tax credits. That's like a serious boost that we get every year. And that's regardless <laughs> of whether you, you, you they took taxes out of your paycheck or not. Um, and I'm talking thousands and thousands of dollars. Like, that's a lot. Um, I mean, during COVID, nobody knew how they were going to support their family and the government was just sending out free money. Hashem has many, many, many ways. So we need to do our part. We don't Can need to lose our minds an over it. An channel, like if someone is not a fixed salary that they're not leaving for ideological reasons, they could make additional channels. They could do real estate in addition absolutely. to them or whatever. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, we, we, we shouldn't and we can't limit ourselves to, you know, just one thing. Um, so yeah, sometimes we need to make another channel. And sometimes it could be far-fetched if that's the only thing you can think of. Just do your best because ultimately, we, we say it in benching every day, Hashem is the one who's deciding who's going to get what and how much and when. Um, and the Rebbe is telling us to trust that Hashem is going to give it to us and, and we're going to get enough for each child. And actually, another thing the Rebbe quotes is that the Rebbe Rashab tells us that the livelihood of Yidin today is compared to the Mun. That we get everything that we need on that day. And if you think about it, it's actually a little bit wild. We like to have food in our house for a week or a month, and some people six months, just to to feel okay. It's like you don't feel good if your house is empty, if your fridge is empty, even if you have tomorrow's breakfast in it. You don't feel good. It's not comfortable. But that's what happened with the man. Nobody got to keep anything in their house. Hashem sent it in the morning. Here's your food. Eat it today. Tomorrow you'll get more. And that's really how our Parnassah works today is that Hashem gives it to us when we need it, but possibly not a moment before. So it's, it's again, another thing we need to have in our mindset is recognizing that we're we're not really able to plan that much in advance necessarily, and that's perfectly okay. Um, and Hashem is, is our only provider, and He'll provide for us and for all of our children who are also His children, and more so His children than ours. I love everything that you said and how you say it. And, I, you know, me personally, I remember a few years back when we were really struggling and I was interested in one channel, as you call it. I used to say Klee, but I guess now we say channel. <laughs> <laughs> I opened up one channel and then Hashem sent in an entirely different channel in a way that I didn't expect, um, in a way that really worked out and also played to my strengths, which was really, you know, so gratifying. Um, I really saw it. I really, really, really saw it. This idea of, you know, Hashem being creative <laughs> and having multiple See, channels to send us. I love that you use that word. I love that you use that word um, because I'm, I'm really into that. I'm really into recognizing not just Hashem is great and amazing, right? Those are very vague words. Hashem is creative. Hashem is smart. Hashem is powerful. Like this, and, and give it like, specifics like the richest CEO in on Wall Street. He has connections that you could never dream of. He has finances that you could never even think of. Hashem is extremely creative. Hashem is the ultimate creativity. So we're not. We're, we're not capable of that. Um, I actually, truth is, now that you mention it, I had quite a few of my jobs. Literally, they, they landed in my pocket. I had a friend call me up. Her uncle was looking for someone to work for her. Um, and, and I worked for him for like five years and then I moved on and then he actually emailed me years later. He wanted me to do a different job for him and it like just worked out for what I needed at that time. Hashem is ultimately creative and he, he can do anything and really he just needs our trust and our open-mindedness to accept that it might not be exactly what we expect um, that we can't always control exactly how it will play out and that we don't need to. And we can expect, we can accept what Hashem is sending our way and, and embrace it and recognize that this is what we need in order to continue with our mission. Unbelievable. I know it sounds so easy. Just have a moon and Betachan, but really, really, really working on our moon and Betachan is, is really where it's at. It's all, 
it's all mindset work. You know, like when you're in school, working on yourself, at least for me, meant like doing more things, like making more hachatas, like doing more things. And really now as an adult, most of my work is in my mind, learning the right things, reading the right things, what I'm absorbing, what am I thinking? Like, what's my internal world like? And like you said, it, it so impacts my myself, my family, what's going on inside me and how in tune I am with, with MS and with the truth. Um, I'm curious if you have any, you know, one last message or takeaway from everything that you've researched. And, and we know, you know, having another child is not simple. The pregnancy is not simple. Many people, you know, besides for throwing up, could be very sick and it, and it could be overwhelming or tiring and then having the baby and, and colic and, and it doesn't end, you know, challenging twos. And then, you know, before you know it, they're teenagers. Like, what do you think are concepts that we could remind ourselves in this challenging, messing, imperfect journey of raising Hashem's beautiful children? Um, yeah, so it's definitely a, a ton of inner work um, being an adult, but especially a parent. Our children really um, push that in us. They force us to look at ourselves and to see how we are actually showing up, how much we are actually practicing what we're telling them to do. It's a ton of inner work, and it takes a lot of time. I think, I guess that the point I want to bring out is something called grace. Um, I feel like that's not used often enough in our communities. We need to give ourselves grace. We need to give our children's grace, our children grace. Um, and we need to really be okay with being really not perfect, not happy all the time, um, not doing everything 100% all the time, um, but just growing bit by bit, you know, doing our best in that moment. Um, I, I would say even my book, I, I got a couple of comments on it before I sent it to print, that when you read it all at once, it's almost too much. And I think I, I agree in a sense. It's really ideally something that you need to read one chapter a week or maybe even a month, like depending on how much you resonate with it. But it's something you need to sit with. It's a journey that took me two years to get through. Um, and it's it's a constant avaida. And it's something I, I still work on. And the reason I love having it in a book is because even for me myself, um, there's certain things that I, I keep going back to that. I keep going back. I mean, one specific post I wrote when I was like two weeks postpartum. And it's almost at that point that you don't feel injured. You don't feel, you know, like you just went through something so difficult anymore. So you kind of want to get up and get out. Um, but you can't or you shouldn't. Um, and I remember feeling very resentful. And I just wrote a whole post talking myself through it about how um, this is very temporary. This is the stage that I'm in right now. Um, but it's very precious and it's very important. And there's a reason I am lying in bed with my baby on top of me because he won't go to sleep any other way because he's two weeks old and that's where he belongs and that's where I belong, right? Um, but every time I have a baby, I feel the same way <laughs> and I need to talk myself through it all over again. And that's really what I want to say is that you're never going to be there, right? I wrote the book. I'm still never going to be there. Somebody also asked me, she's like, you know, don't, how, how, aren't you intimidated, you know, like that you're this whole author now and now you have to be all perfect. And I'm like, no, no, that's not, my book doesn't say I'm perfect. It doesn't say I should be perfect. And I never, ever will. And the reason I wrote the book is because I need the book every single day. So yes, I need different chapters at different stages and different times. Um, and they're all, they're very deep. They're not like, you know, just telling you what the Rebbe said, like I'm making this comment here. It's really about processing it and taking it in. Um, and it really helps you do that. And it really helps me do that. So um yeah, so it's a journey. It's a journey. Accept the journey. Embrace the journey. You'll never be perfect. You never should be perfect. The way you are is just fine. And parenting is hard. It's hard. Um, but it's worth it. And it's it, and it's a journey that Hashem is giving us as a gift, really. Hence the gift of children. <laughs> I love it. Children. By the way, I have to relate a lot. Like, I remember once, like, 
feeling so disappointed about something and posting it on like a chat with my sister-in-law and someone's like, oh, why don't you open your Tanya book to this in this chapter and reading it? And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> so true. <laughs> yeah, like we, we write it for ourselves just as much as for anyone else. And I'm like, who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. It's yeah. a constant journey and we're, we're a work in progress. We'll never be there. We'll never be there. I am in a much better place than I was seven years ago. I am absolutely not there yet, but I'm happy. I'm comfortable and I am constantly, I'm constantly fighting in my mind, but the fight is a lot easier now because I have a lot of practice, but my mind always wants to tell me you're not good enough. This is so hard. Why are you even doing this? Um, you know, that the kids, I don't know, just all kinds of stupid negative things. And then I just tell myself, I'm fine. This is fine. This is normal. And maybe tomorrow I'll feel better, right? Sometimes, some days you just don't feel good. And so you're not able to show up the way you want to show up. Like, that's okay. That's okay. It's okay to have a bad day. And it doesn't disqualify you as a mother. It doesn't ruin your kids or your family. You had a bad day. And honestly, children are the most forgiving. Most, most forgiving. No matter what you'll do to them, two hours later, they'll come, Mommy, I love you so much. <laughs> that's all they want. They just want your love. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so, so much, Chaya. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the Optimizing Mother podcast. Please subscribe and share. Thank you for joining us, wishing us all so much nachas from our children, from the gift of children. So much hatzlacha. So much benchas. And may we experience the true freedom as we're preparing for this Chag Acheros, the true and ultimate freedom, really, with the coming of Mashiach now. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. And hatzlacha to all. <laughs>